Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today it's episode 562, and we are gonna talk about Sin's Rising Prelude. We're gonna dip over to the Spider-Man stuff for a minute because, you know, the Sin Eater story has me interested. Sin Eater is a character that kind of ties into Eddie Brock. And although so far, because I've read up until the current issue, but we're only talking about the prelude today, but we'll do a video coming up soon where I discuss uh, issues 45 through 48. Uh, and then that'll get us ready for the big finale. And I think there's going to be another one shot right before the finale too called The Sins of Norman Osborn. So we'll get into all that later. So uh, today is just going to be talking about the one shot prelude called Sins Rising Prelude. And it was an amazing Spider-Man issue. I think it's like five bucks. You can pick it up on Comixology or at your local comic stop, uh, you know, shop. It came out about a month ago maybe a little over a month ago now. And uh, cause these are coming out like every two weeks, I think. So maybe this was like two months ago and then they've been pumping out an issue every two weeks, you know, written by Nick Spencer. This book is written by Nick as well. And uh, Guillermo Sana is the, uh, the artist of this issue. And so we'll get into all the Sin Rising stuff and then we're gonna dip over in, there was like a Savage Avengers one shot and Venom the End, which we never talked about. We'll talk about that in the next episode. Uh, so we'll kind of catch up on those. I think there's some Ravencroft stuff we'll have coming up at some point, like in the next couple weeks, because um, they, they did a bunch of one shots for there. And then I also think there was two Web of Venoms that I didn't cover called Wraith and The Good Son. So we're catching up now. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna record a couple episodes tonight and I'll record a couple more maybe tomorrow. And we'll just try to sprinkle them out through the next you know, two weeks or so. And uh, there's also Venom number 27 and number 28 that I think 28 is coming out soon. So we'll dive into that when it comes out and I'll probably just cram 27 and 28 together side by side and we'll do those both in one episode. So for now, let's catch up on the Spider-Man stuff because the Sin Eater, even though they're not really connecting him fully to Eddie, which I was hoping Eddie would play some part in the storyline, um, but we're not at the end yet. So for all I know, maybe Eddie can make an appearance, which I hope he does. But with Null and everything else going on in his world, I don't know if he'll make an appearance in this. Um, so it might just be a Spider-Man story, which is fine. But hopefully at least Daredevil appears in this because Daredevil was in the original The Death of Gene DeWolf storyline and uh, he played a big part in that, you know, of kind of pulling Spider-Man back from going too far. So that'd be interesting to see that happen again, although Peter is more mature now and he's kind of at a point where he might not really need the help to get pulled back from the edge like that. I think he's kind of, if he was going to kill Norman Osborn or anybody else or Sin Eater or, or characters like that, he would have done it by now. And so I think now Peter is at a different place mentally in his life. And they talk a little bit about that in the next issue of the Amazing Spider-Man book. So we'll get into that in the next episode uh, that we do when we discuss this you know, comic series. But for now, this one is just a focus on Stan Carter. Stan Carter is the secret identity of the original Sin Eater. And there's been a lot of debate, especially on this channel, about Stan Carter. Uh, like I said, uh, Eddie Brock at one point, he worked for a place called the Daily Globe. Uh, not the Daily Bugle, but the Daily Globe, like a competitor of theirs. And he was a rising star journalist over there. And the big thing that got his name out there, uh, you know, that made him kind of uh, blow up and become more popular and famous was that he was covering the Sin Eater stuff. He claimed, uh, or not claimed, actually this was happening. Someone was calling him and telling him that he was the Sin Eater and, uh, you know, and that they want to confess things to Eddie and they want Eddie to tell his story. And Eddie promised to do it, but he didn't want to give up the identity of the person that was calling him until finally he got pressured to do so. He gave that identity out there and it turns out that person that was calling Eddie was not actually the real Sin Eater. Um, it wasn't Stan Carter, it was somebody else that kind of was set up, you know, like by Stan in a way. And so uh, so Eddie kind of, that's what ruined his life. That's what made him go into the church and want to commit suicide um, is, well, that, and later we found out cancer was a part of it too, but then also losing Anne and things like that. So, you know, Eddie's life fell apart because of this moment, because of Sin Eater's true identity being exposed when Spider-Man captures Stan Carter and unmasks him on public television and stuff. And that's what made Eddie hate Peter because the photograph was taken by Peter, um, even though it was obviously Peter Spider-Man. Um, but uh, so that's what, you know, started Eddie Brock's path, I guess, on the path that he was on and into becoming Venom. So uh, this, I was hoping Eddie would play more of a part in this, but really you're seeing this whole issue from Stan's point of view. And you're in hell with Stan. Stan went straight to hell for all the crimes he has committed. Um, even though he was not of right mind, uh, they kind of touch on that a little bit, how he is, he's been broken since childhood. He went through a traumatic event. They talk about how he lived with his parents 
and he really didn't kind of get along with them and didn't really like kind of, you know, what they were all about. And his dad was uh, like a cop, I think, and he did some bad things. And, and they so he has a screwed up childhood that led him to um, his parents getting, I think, captured or killed. And so he had to move and live with his grandfather, who was like this, uh, you know, um, kind of cult religious leader out in, um, you know, kind of like in the middle of, the, of nowhere, really. And uh, he had his own congregation of people that came and worshipped. And, you know, he like lifted up snakes, you know, and did that whole thing and was like, look, I'm protected by the Lord. That's why these snakes won't bite me and everything. And I guess one day a snake did bite him. And his congregation who believed in him and worshipped, you know, at the altar there of, of his kind of religious cult, as it were, uh, they turned on Stan's grandfather, and I believe they killed him too. And they uh, talked about, or there was this myth in this in their kind of cult about this entity called the Sin Eater. And that's where Stan gets the name from. And this is all new, like, lore, because I don't believe any of this was ever put in the comics before. I think there was like two or three issues of Spider-Man uh, when Stan first popped up as Sin Eater. And then later on, I think like around issue 136 or one something like around there is when they, you know, where Stan died and they did the Gene DeWolf story and everything. Um, so they, this is all new lore as far as I, I know, at least anyway. Uh, I am certain, I, I read a lot of Spider-Man books, but I am not an encyclopedia on them. The, and I wasn't when I started the Venom show either. I became an encyclopedia full of Venom stuff and I still get things wrong, but still... I have all this Venom knowledge in me now because of the show. So maybe one day if we ever do a Spider-Man show, I'll become smarter at uh, Spider-Man and get all my facts straight. Um, but so I'm, I'm kind of in uncharted territory here as far as like remembering properly. But but Stan is, uh, all this lore seems like new lore, uh, to me at least. And, and they're kind of peeling back the layers of his origin and showing that he's had a, a sense of wanting to do the right thing sometimes, but also um, just had a terrible upbringing. So it kind of reminded me of Eddie a little bit, although they go a little further with um, with Stan here and his story. And like I said, there's this lore of this entity called the Sin Eater. So he remember he's remembering his life because he's in hell and he's kind of reliving kind of his most tragic moments uh, in hell. And while he's going through his life in hell, he remembers being a kid and he remembers, um, you know, seeing this Sin Eater entity over his grandfather's dead body after his grandfather was killed. What they do is they, they take the people who sin and they put them out almost like a Viking funeral, although I don't think they light them on fire. They just surround them with food. Um, and so basically the food represents your sins and the Sin Eater will emerge from the woods lean over your dead body and eat the food that's around you to kind of devour your sins in hopes that you'll be forgiven, I guess, and go to a better place in the afterlife. And that's kind of the lore that they're adding and the backstory they're adding to Stan Carter's life. And so that's where Stan Carter, I guess, got the identity of Sin Eater was he saw this creature float out of the woods when he was a kid to eat the food around his grandfather. Now, whether he really saw that or not, or whether hell's manifesting that, or whether Kindred in some way is manifesting it, we don't really know, because if you remember, there is no ruler in hell right now. Uh, it's supposed to be Johnny Blaze, but as we covered in our Ghost Rider episodes on another show, Johnny Blaze is out running around on Earth with Mephisto, and Lilith has yet to take over the crown of hell and become the queen of hell, so she's not on the throne yet. So technically, there's no one really running hell, which I think explains how Kindred's able to come into hell and summon Stan back to the world of the living. That's at least my theory anyway. I don't know if I'm right about that. But that's my theory. And, uh, and they don't say that in the book. Again, like I said, it's just a theory. So Stan is remembering all these moments in his life. And again, I don't know if he actually saw a Sin Eater ghost because it kind of a little bit looks like Kindred uh, without the, the wraps and stuff and without the bandages. Um, but it kind of floats and it has like this hoodie kind of jacket thing like that like Kindred has. Kindred has like this purple jacket with a hood on it. Um, and it kind of looks a little bit like that. I think it's a little uh, greener or, or maybe there's a little purple in it too. Um, but obviously purple and green are the Sin Eater colors uh, that Stan wears. So he wears like a green ski mask and he's got like a purple... Or maybe it's a purple ski mask. I'm like, my memory's all messed up. I think it's a green ski mask and he's got like a purple jacket or something. So it's interesting that uh, as he's in hell, he gets summoned out like by um, like a, a, a talk show host after he's going through his life and he's remembering Gene DeWolf. There's one thing to add in here that I don't know if I like and I, because I don't remember this being in the original story, but I could be wrong, was Gene DeWolf sleeping with Stan. Um, I guess Stan was trying to figure out 
who killed his partner because uh, he felt he was like, oh, my partner was actually a good guy and he was keeping me on the straight and narrow because I, I became a cop kind of like my dad, but I was trying to be a good cop. And then my partner, who I thought was innocent or it was an innocent guy, gets killed. And that kind of awakened those childhood memories and caused Stan to become the Sin Eater. And once he decided to become the Sin Eater, he started looking into all these cases and he found out that Gene DeWolf, who was a fellow cop that he respected and who knew his partner well as, you know, also, um, he saw that she was lying to him. So he ended up sleeping with her and going through her phone. It was funny because that book came out like in the late 70s, I think early 80s, and or maybe somewhere in there. And uh, and so he has, like, Gene DeWolf has passed out after they had sex and he grabs her phone and it needs a finger lock to open it. And I'm like, oh, that's funny because that phone definitely didn't exist when that original story <laughs> was written. Um, so it's like them kind of kind of updating it, trying to make it seem like it wasn't that far in the past, you know. Um, but, you know, I don't know, just Gene sleeping with them just kind of, I was like, ah, I don't know. Like, uh, it seems, I don't know, like I said, if that happened in the old comic, I'm just not remembering it properly. But uh, it seems like a weird thing to add to the lore that he, that's how he found out she was lying to him. He had to sleep with her. I'm like, ah, eh, Gene didn't seem like the type that just ran and slept with people. Um, you know, I don't know. Then again, she was kind of like a, kind of a gruff cop, kind of like normally you would see a male in that role where it's like, oh, I'm a gruff cop but I, and I sleep around sometimes. So maybe that's kind of like the vibe this, you know, Nick Spencer got from Gene reading those old stories. Because apparently they say in this, Nick Lowe writes a letter in the back that talks about how they've been working on the story for a while and that Nick, Lowe, uh, Nick Spencer is a big fan of the Gene DeWolf storyline. So maybe he gleamed more off it than I can remember because I've only read that story like two or three times and I, and once for this show, but that was years ago. So I, you know, I can't remember. So I'm going to trust them on this one that maybe that's a, a quality of that Gene might have done is if she uh, felt something for somebody like a, a fellow uh, police officer that maybe she would have slept with him, but I just, it didn't feel like a Gene DeWolf thing when I read it in the book. Um, especially when the only purpose was to get information from her. I'm like, wow, he, they didn't have the phones back then. So he could have easily just like went by her desk and found some file or something. I don't know. Um, or like some post-it note or something that like she was like reminding herself to do something later. Any, it, there's so many different ways you could have done it that I just felt like, eh, sleeping with her just seemed, did seem out of character kind of for both of them really. Um, so anyway, so you learn more about Stan, you learn more about the guy that he kind of conned into taking credit for the Sin Eater stuff in the beginning. And I think it's the same guy who might have called Eddie and, and you know, claimed to be the real Sin Eater. And then they show Stan killing him um, after, you know, he accomplished his mission. And then they even did a really neat thing where they show when Stan tried to rehabilitate himself. He went after he got caught at the end of Gene DeWolf's uh, Death of Gene DeWolf's story. After he gets caught by Spider-Man stuff, he goes to jail or he goes to like a, a facility where they try to rehabilitate him and they say they cured him and they put him back out on the street. And that's where this book actually goes and takes actual pages from those old Spider-Man comics. So they didn't even, I don't even think they redrew them. I think they're just the straight up, right out of, I think, Amazing Spider-Man or Spectacular Spider-Man, whichever books they were in just straight up the pages of where Stan died, where he goes out without a loaded gun, dressed as a Sin Eater, when there's a, a second Sin Eater that took over the mantle, but Stan goes out thinking he was actually, became the Sin Eater again. Um, it turns out he he didn't. It was, uh, it was someone else that was imitating him. So he might've actually been on the path to become a better person and get through the, these sins and this, this, you know, this life of his, um, but, uh, but he, was convinced that he was still the sin eater and had like a split personality. And that wasn't the case at all. Um, so he went out in front of a bunch of cops, had a gun, had a hostage and the cops killed him. And uh, turns out the gun wasn't even loaded. He just did it because he wanted to die. And that's how he ends up in hell in this story. So when he remembers all that, uh, that's when Kindred shows up and says, hey, I'm gonna bring you back to the world of the living. And he's like, no, I don't wanna go back. I deserve to be here. I can handle the heat, you know, the heat's not so bad because I've accepted that I'm a monster and that I should be in hell. And he goes, so I'm fine being here. And Kindred's like, but you're not. Like you were the sin eater and I need help cleaning people or cleansing people of their sins. And I can make it worth your while, but also you need to really embrace who you are. Ever since you were a child, you were on the path to embody the Sin Eater story that you remember from a kid. So you are destined to be this. So that's why I don't know if Kindred is manipulating his memories when Kindred came into hell, which that's an amazing power that Kindred apparently has. If they can just, 
this person could walk. It took Dr. Doom like a ton of work along with Dr. Strange to go into hell to demand, uh, you know, his mother's soul from Mephisto. And that was Dr. Doom. And Dr. Doom is awesome. So Kindred being able to do this seems a little weird. I don't know. I'm, I'm still not... They, I'm really hoping that Nick Spencer sticks the landing with revealing who Kindred is because this Kindred's the most boring part of the Nick Spencer Spider-Man book, in my opinion. I think all the stuff Nick does with Spider-Man and Boomerang and, and everything and all the characters that he does, the podcast with J. Jonah Jameson, like all these books have been great, minus the Kindred stuff. I actually think Kindred is the least interesting concept that Nick Spencer is working with right now. And he's dragging it out way too much. So apparently at the end of this storyline uh, in issue 850, which is also issue 49 of Amazing Spider-Man, which is coming out soon, apparently that'll tell us maybe who Kindred is finally. But I don't really even care. <laughs> and, and whoever it is, I can't imagine, I'm, you know, it's someone who can just travel right into hell easily like this. Uh, even if there is no one in charge of hell, it still takes a lot to just go down there. And yet Kindred was able to do it, come down, grab Stan, convince Stan to be the Sin Eater again, which seems unlikely because Stan seemed content with being where he was. And then just after two lines of dialogue, like he was convinced to put the mask back on and come back to Earth. So again, I don't know how much is he's being manipulated or how much of him he's actually making the choice or if Kindred is forcing him to make the choices. I hope it's something like that. I hope, because I actually, I want to believe that Stan died tr trying to be a better person, you know? Like, even though he took a hostage, he didn't have a loaded gun. He knew what he was doing. He wanted to die um, because of the pain of maybe being, having a split personality or or the uh, even the chance of the Sin Eater coming back through him. He didn't want to live with that. He didn't want to hurt anyone anymore. So I kind of like that conclusion of Stan. So I'm hoping he didn't really willingly make this choice and that he is being pulled and puppeted by kindred somehow because uh, he's certainly serving kindred's needs in some way and we're going to find out more about that in the next episode where we talk about these so maybe a couple episodes from now um but uh, for now like i just want to talk about this prelude where stan is now brought back to earth at the end and he is serving kindred somehow and he has this weapon that when he shoots you it doesn't actually kill you but it takes away your sins and and puts them into stan also gives stan um, your ability. So if he shoots you and you have like a special power, he might obtain that power as well. So something really unique is going on here and I'm curious to dive more into it and we will in a future episode. So for now, this is the Sin Rising Prelude, the one shot that came out. If you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend that you do. And like I said, in a future episode, probably two or three episodes from now, we'll talk about Amazing Spider-Man number 45 to 48. So that's like the bulk of the story for Sin Rising. And then we'll do a third final episode on it where we talk about, um, you know, the, the one shot called The Sins of Norman Osborn and issue 850 slash issue 49. We'll talk about both of those in one episode together. So this will be kind of like part one of a three part Sin Rising coverage. And I wanted to start small because I knew I had a lot to say about this prelude and I figured some of you guys might as well, including Swordsman. I feel like, you know, we get into a lot of debates, uh, Swordsman and I, in the comments about Stan Carter and what his real motivations are and whether he, you know, Eddie was really, you know, just negligent at his job and that's what caused him to screw up. Or if, you know, he was, super, you know, manipulated on a level that um, that kind of exonerates him from being bad at his job. Like we, we go through it, we talk about it a lot, we go back and forth. Uh, but this, unfortunately, didn't have any Eddie in it, but it still had uh, a lot about Stan in it. And they added a lot to his backstory. And I just kind of want to know what you guys think of that. Because me, I'm mixed on some of it. I do like the setup. I like that Sin Eater's back. But again, I hope he didn't really... When he makes the choice and he says, yeah, fine, he puts the mask back on. And he's like, I'll be the Sin Eater again. It didn't... Again, it felt a little like... I don't feel like that's what Stan would do. If he really was content with being in hell... Um, and and you know was like, this is where I belong. I'm evil. This And then I guess Kindred was like... Well, if you're evil, then maybe you should just come back to Earth and you can help me make other people better. So I could see, you know, there's definitely manipulation there, but I, I still don't see Stan saying yes, really. But that's Nick Spencer's take on it. And apparently he's, you know, a big fan of that, that era of Spider-Man. So I'm going to trust it. I'm going to see where he goes and where he takes it. And I'm going to see, I guess, the reveal of who Kindred is, but it better be good. That's all I got to say, Nick Spencer, because I don't like the Kindred stuff at all. I think it's the worst part of this whole series so far, and I'm not even interested. I actually don't even care who Kindred is, although until now where I saw that Kindred could go into hell and pull a soul out of it, and now I'm like, 
okay, well, that's unique. So, like, someone who has to have dabbled in some, like, dark magic, like, you know, Doctor Strange or Doctor Doom, like, is can only be able to do that. So, so now that makes me a little curious of who Kindred is, and I hope it's not someone dumb that would not have access to those abilities, because now I'm starting to wonder, like, uh, you know, if Kindred is more cosmically tied in some way than than we uh, you know originally thought they were because uh because that's quite a feat to go down to hell and do this so um let me know what you think let me know what your guesses are because the the reveal of kindred will be coming up very soon so i guess we'll all find out soon so let your guesses be known down below and any other questions or any other comments you want to make about this issue let those be known down below as well and we'll continue our conversation down there as always thank you guys so much for watching the show like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you in the next episode peace